Need any help? Oh. All I can get. Welcome to Unseen Classics, Episode 6. This is Jason. This is Alex. And what are we excited about this week? Um, a busy month, work-wise. Yes, we have tons of projects coming up this week. We have, let's see, a commercial that we're going to be doing for a contest for traveling or travel type of thing for Colorado that we'll be working with David Lasker. And we worked with David on the last two projects. Job. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wait, yeah, yeah, yeah. Protocol the, uh, 6. Protocol 6. Protocol 6 was a, a failed NBC pilot, but <laughs> at least we were able to submit a pilot. And uh, so we'll be working on that one. We have System76, who we've worked with before. They're a local computer company, Linux-based computers. And uh, we're going to be maybe shooting in the space right now that you guys can see because we are recording this one. And we said that last time. It's working, though, this time, right? Yeah, we got it. We have the banner, so you can. there's no doubt that we're fourth guy entertainment. <laughs> um, we have the, our state stuff that we do for the adoption. Uh, we have some Wel- Welshire, I guess that's, we count from a month from now, even, even though that goes into April. Um, and then what's the big one that you're excited about? <laughs> the big one? The big one. You mean that contest? Yeah, the Road Reel Mike, or R- Road Reel 2016. Road Rules, Real, Real World Challenge? Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Um, a particular project that uh, that we have been kind of kicking around ever since we met actually it was the first pitch you gave me yeah yeah and um because i had just written it and we tried to make it i always sort of see it as we tried twice yeah yeah um it was a little ambitious as the first one out of the gate for you yeah so we're going to do that finally and that's yeah. kind of all I want to say about it right now. Yeah, so the condensed version fits on, along with what uh, the contest is for. You know, very short. The, I mean, obviously we have never finalized it. We, there's a few different versions, but it's definitely over three minutes, no matter which version that we've tried to do or has been written. So lots of projects. I think originally we, are, we always tried to keep, I always wanted to keep it around 10 minutes. Yeah, I think that the one I was, was wrote was like 20 minutes at least. Um, so that we're definitely going to be busy. We're going to be trying to keep this up. Next week, we're going to switch it up a little bit, and we're going to actually watch an Unseen Lemon. And what are we calling that? No, it's, 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 it's Unsqueezed Lemons. And that'll be The Room. The Room, Tommy Wiseau's classic. Oh, my God. You have, like, no idea how awesome this is going to be. Because uh, finally, yeah, you haven't seen it. Mm-mm. I have. And I've been wanting to go see it at the uh, Landmark or the Esquire, or whatever it is. A they, little midnight movie? Yeah, they do it at midnight. But I feel like you need to see it first, and then we'll go see it with like a crazy crowd and see all their weird traditions and whatnot. Yeah, the only one that I've seen that's like similar to that is Troll 2, like that has all the people that are like, you know, they have conventions and midnight showings. Well, it's it's similar to like, you know, when you go see Rocky Horror, and if you've never seen it before, you're immediately labeled a virgin, and they write like V on your forehead, and all the chicks are all up ons, and you know, you got your your callbacks, the things you shout at the screen and whatnot, and the room, they, they have all those kind of things. Yeah, so that'll be definitely interesting uh, to to check out the room next week. What are we excited about, though, in the realm of, films and tv is there anything that have got us excited well after uh after goodfellas last week i actually went and watched the wolf of wall street and i really enjoyed it um scores easy no de niro though yeah it was no de niro although um leonardo dicaprio was pretty much uh what's his name henry henry hill yes yes it was like they did they, they he, he took like the very end of uh, Goodfellas when he breaks the fourth wall and and he st- he gets up out of his deposition and starts talking to the camera and it was it, but it was it was like that but for the whole movie in Wolf of Wall Street yeah and you know he decided to go back to a life of crime and drugs and just really embrace it in a way that maybe he hadn't fully embraced it before or at least a different way <laughs> yeah that's definitely a, a good film. What's the the big rattle right now is the the Ghostbusters trailer that's got everybody uh, either this for it or against it. I don't know how I feel about it. Like it, not like in like a 
in like a I feel abused and I'm still trying to process it kind of way. Like a more, I wanted a Ghostbusters three for years, and if this is the closest I'm gonna get, I'm gonna have a tiny bit of excitement, and I, I kind of do. Like it, it, it's it's uh, I don't know. I, I don't really know how I felt about the trailer. It was kind of cool. Like it felt it was fun. Like hearing the song and like seeing the kind of different versions of uh the original thing. Well, which I think that's if I take aside my dislike for for the director and for the actresses involved, if I put aside that real quick about did, the actresses, all most Melissa McCarthy is the only one I'm iffy about. I love everybody else that was on SNL. Kristen Wiig was my hero for a while when when she was on, uh, and and Kate McKinnon's fun. Leslie Jones is awesome, as she's always on a, a Weekend Update, hitting on the host. Yeah, I haven't seen, I can't say a movie that I've liked that they've been in. Maybe despite the fact them being in it, definitely don't like McCarthy. What I didn't like about the trailer, though, as if you're doing a remake and you're hitting the points of what people like about it, that's great. But then why open it as if it's a sequel? Because it says 30 years. Yeah. I mean, what? So that, that, that kind of, I think that people were confused. Okay, well, what you said, this was a reboot or a remake, or is it, you know, sort of sequel or what if when we, because most of the original cast has filmed cameos. And what if like, when we get there and we watch it, like it turns out that, you know, their cameos are actually in character. And there was like this big shrouded secret. Maybe that might be, that might be something, but I think that was some of the confusion that I saw when I, put aside the the hate and was looking at the comments that was one of the things that i was like okay i can see that where it wasn't just somebody who was like oh my god i hate this or you know whatever yeah but my thing was just you know i i don't think i don't think it needed a remake you had you had Ackroyd and murray and moraine it's exactly when they're in their prime and and none of these girls are those people even if you you can say that even if you've liked those movies they're but, not the same well i mean it's still the same dna i feel like because it's it's like most of the well that most of the uh cast of the original were like all snl kind of people or sketch people uh sctv but yeah pretty much with the exception of bernie hudson the rest of them were all in snl and um, and then you know, with this new cast, they're all SNL people, with the exception of like Melissa McCarthy. Was she ever in the cast? I don't think so. I know she's hosted, but anyway, but yeah, yeah I but think that... she just had that whatever TV show that Mike and Molly or whatever uh -huh. she was on. Well, I, but my my thing is that that's similar enough. But those is Kristen Wiig is specifically has already passed her prime. Her no. hit, yes, her hit with movies had. It was at least five or six years. Ago. Well, not even just about movies. Like as far as uh, from a from a creative and comedic standpoint, like she's still she's still awesome. Like she was great on SNL, and then you know since then she's done voice work on all kinds of stuff that me and Wendy have seen. Like she does a she did Lola the Bunny on um, one of the new uh, Looney Tunes shows. It kind of set it set it, set itself up like a sitcom, you know, and uh, and she's just she plays that crazy character so well. And then she does she does other other characters like that weird flirty character, um, I don't know. But you haven't watched any SNL, it's, so it's hard to say. But no, I I, I really love Kristen Wiig, so I'm excited to see her in something. And at least it's when I was when they were first talking about it, and her name was involved. I was that was like one of the only things that was kind of making me be like, all right, maybe we'll see. Yeah, well, we'll see when it comes out. What? June, July, something, August, September. <laughs> it I don't comes know. out this year. I can't. I'm, I'm, all I'm thinking about right now is uh, uh, not in like a super excited way, but I can't think beyond Batman versus Superman and Suicide Squad. Yes, there's definitely. I'm also excited. <gasps> and uh, 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 ten, uh, 10 Cloverfield Lane. Wendy and I are totally going to go see that. I'll watch it. I'll watch it on Netflix. I'll also watch Ghostbusters on Netflix. I'm not seeing it in the theater. They're not getting my money. <sighs> I might. They're they're passes. We got free passes, so maybe we'll use passes. So it's not like. I mean, they're getting someone else. How many free money. passes do you have? Um, Wendy's aunt and uncle sent us like a shit ton for Christmas. Oh, okay. I was gonna say because I mean you might use them up before. Yeah. But this is also a lot of. There's a lot of movies that you say you're gonna see in the theater and don't see. So it's always. Hey, a, we saw Deadpool. That was the last one. Followed through on that one, and oh, we're totally gonna go see Ten Cloverfield Creed. Lane. You didn't see Creed. Didn't see Creed. Not yet. 
A lot of the. Big... I really wanted to see Creed, but instead I saw uh, Star Wars. That's true. You did get to see Star Wars. So, and we still have to wait. I mean, at least there's nothing about Rogue One. So we'll be seeing what happens with that. I'm assuming they supposedly might be a trailer with Batman and Superman. Maybe who knows? They, everything. Everything. Rogue a rumor. One. Rogue One. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be cool. Well, you know, Mads is actually not even a villain in it. He came out. We'll see how he worded it had me interested. Because I didn't he said, think he was a villain. I thought he was part of the, the rebel squadron. Well, I mean, he always plays a villain for the most part as a big, you know, in his big roles in films. I mean, obviously in TV, um, but it's how he worded it. He said, my character doesn't see himself as a villain. Something to that same. It wasn't that point blank. Well, that's like every villain. So, so it could be like, oh, OK, in this idea. So that'll definitely be interesting. Uh, supposedly Vader's supposed to have a huge role, so it'd be nice to see Hayden Christensen again. Miss him. See what he's up to. See what he's up. Well, we'll not be seeing him because he'll be in the mask at least. But James Earl Jones, you got to do it before he dies. I mean, he's like 88 years old. <laughs> you know, you got to get him in. I feel like there's a group of older actors that, if they're doing voice stuff, that let's let's just record as much as we possibly can, <laughs> to just to make sure that there's no issues. Uh, because they have to think about that. Because other people have tried, they've they've tried to have other people do Vader, and it just for he's so distinct. I've just never heard anybody do Vader as as well as he does. So, let's get into what we watched this week. It was fun. I really we watched uh, Blazing Saddles this week, and I I really enjoyed it. It was our first comedy for uh, for this show so far. Next week, it's not intended as a comedy, but it will definitely come off as one. But um enough talk about next week we're talking about blazing saddles mel brooks 1974 mel brooks gene wilder clevon little uh we had richard Pryor who did got a writing um, credit yeah because going in I, I guess i just heard his of his involvement because going in i was like i thought richard Pryor played the sheriff but um i was wrong but when we saw his name because i had said that before we started watching it and then we saw his name in the writing credits i was like ah there he is yeah at the time he wasn't very well known. He hadn't actually done very many movie roles, if at all. So Mel Brooks wanted him to be in it, and they were like, nope. Not only do we not trust him to to carry the film, he's also a drug addict, and he's erratic, and he's this and that. So yeah, they uh, said, can he write? And they're like, yeah, sure. Cleavon, Cleavon's his name, right? Mm-hmm. He uh, He's a Shakespearean actor. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, he I guess at that point in time, he, was, he could only get uh, – sort of comedic roles and not the sort of really serious Sidney Poitier kind of kind of things. Yeah, back then there was still a, a barrier. I mean, it was shortly, I mean, you're just a few years outside of uh, the civil rights movement. So I think that there was a time that it was still difficult. I mean, even now to a degree, there's still an issue, you know, um, <clears throat> that people feel, you know, the Oscars just going by and stuff that, you know, black actors or actresses don't get the same roles as as white actors and you know they even had that god to egypt that supposedly had all white people yeah <laughs> that Alex was your director Perez. right crow well, it was, yeah he did the crow he his did our robot dark not, city he should have kept his mouth shut. oh come on alex what what, what the crap um another, another cool part of the cast i really enjoyed was uh harvey corman yep from uh, like i knew i recognized him but i couldn't place it right away and then like right before uh right before you found him i um i was like is that the guy from carol burnett and all like because the only guy from Carol Burnett I could think of was Tim Conway. I couldn't remember him, but yeah, I, I figured it out. Yeah, and we of course had Mel Brooks playing three roles. I mean, he played the governor. He was the uh, Yiddish, <laughs> the the Yiddish chief. Yeah, that's what he was speaking was Yiddish. And actually, I didn't really catch it, although yeah, I've what seen was the it before. One? He was uh, one of the people in line, but he had like shades. I mean, he was like under. Oh, he like speak going to get badges and go screw yeah. up the. Okay, yeah. So and uh, the other Madeline Kahn was in it, and uh, we had Higgins. Hey. Who's Higgins? Higgins. Uh, John Hillerman is uh, Higgins from Magnum PI. Oh. He was like the caretaker that Magnum would stay at the mansion in in Hawaii, and uh, he was in there. He's the one that's reading the uh, um, when the sheriff is coming in oh. and he's like practicing to to read uh for that and then dom de Luis was the buddy bazaar who was that dom de Luis was the director in, in the film inside the that's film. what okay you know cannonball run he was in a bunch of stuff he had a short no, i know who dom de Luis show. is i used to watch his show when i was a kid i saw him in the credits and i was like looking for him and then i was like oh yeah i couldn't figure out who he was. didn't have his like mustache or go to i think he had a beard or something for most of the stuff he had done and he was like baby faced in the film so 
it took me a minute to be like, oh, that's him. I had no idea. Well, I did have an idea, but now I do. Uh, then um, Mongo was played by an ex NFL player, Alex Karras. Karras, Karras. Alex Karras, like that. like James Patterson, Alex Karras. No, C K A R R E S. Karras. Karras. Oh, oh, okay. Sounds more more correct. Karras. Maybe he'll Caress? maybe he'll send us a comment and say you guys didn't say my name right. Uh, um, apologies. So that's kind of the, the the cast and stuff. So let's start off before we get into what the movie was about and, and all that stuff. What did you think the film was? I I did know a little uh, a little bit more about this one going in than say like some like Metropolis or Taxi Driver. Um, I. Uh, I, I knew it was about a town that gets a black sheriff and hilarity and craziness ensues. Uh, I knew it was Mel Brooks. Um, apparently didn't know too much about the cast because I thought uh, Richard Pryor was in it. I knew Gene Wilder was in it. Um, and uh, it, it that's and yeah, that's about it. And like my, my parents and I've seen my, like my mom and a bunch of uh, family back East kind of quoted a lot. And uh, so it, it, it wasn't too foreign to me going in. Why Why do you think that it's a movie that you hadn't seen? Do you oh, think it just never came up? Or? I'm, I'm pretty sure I feel like I was sheltered from it a bit by my mother because I don't think she wanted me hearing the N-word shouted so many times. Mm. Yeah, which with the you know after you after you watch uh, Django or Hateful Eight, yeah, uh, because I was I asked you about that afterward. I was like, you know, a, a part of me thinks like, oh, you could never make this today. But then like you think of a Tarantino movie, and yeah, and 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 don't and believe me, I mean there was backlash involved with with uh, you know both films by Tarantino. A lot of people came out, but having the actors in the case of hateful eight samuel jackson saying i support this there's a reason for it this is the time and then jamie fox with django coming out and saying i support this in the same way that mel brooks came out and said well hey richard price supports this and only the hateful people in the film in blazing saddles are the ones that use it gene wilder never says it so it and, makes sense in the context. And outside of that, um, the uh, but also the sort of style of comedy, and maybe sometimes going a little uh, hot buttony with it beyond the uh, the N word. Um, you think about like Family Guy and stuff like that. Like that's that sort of comedy still alive today. And I hadn't, I never saw a Thousand Ways to Die in the West. But how much of Blazing Saddles DNA do you think is in it? Probably a lot. I'd I'd, I'd have to say, you know. He is definitely McFarland's one of the people that's you know not really afraid to. And at this point, so many people have complained about Family Guy that it's just not even worth it. I think that they've just given up. And you know, also during this time, All in the Family was on the air, so it wasn't like so alien to people. And you know, so I think that that was part of it too. And really, I don't think I mean Mel Grip Brooks didn't. That was back in his I don't give a fuck time. <laughs> you know, he didn't really care. He, you know, that style of comedy was uh, very much an old style of just really one liners. There's a lot of vaudeville just, type stuff. Yeah. You know, one liners and stuff. And there's been films since then have kind of tried to do that um, to various degrees. I mean, the I Zucker. Think the, Zucker stuff, I mean, definitely the scary movie and stuff is in the vein kind of where you're spoofing satire. I think that uh, – I think the scary little... movie and the epic movie, the guys who make those movies are more Zucker-inspired possibly than – but, you know, can't have that kind of comedy without Mel Brooks, I suppose. Well, yeah, because uh, uh, direct uh, – Not solely Mel Brooks. Well, but, you I know. mean, Airplane, th- those are definitely – basically what airplane is just more to yeah. the extreme but airplane is direct relation to because um they had seen blazing saddles and young frankenstein they that that was in what inspired how far survive. removed are they uh maybe about four or five years uh uh-huh. so fa- fairly fairly new so let's talk about what is this uh movie loosely based about <laughs> Because, I mean, there's a thread to it, but it's more jokes than it is really following a strict narrative. Uh, re- evil Railroad Tycoon, played by Corman, needs to build around this uh, patch of quicksand that's very comedically discovered at the beginning of the movie uh, when we meet uh, Bart. And, um, and But in order to build around the patch of quicksand, he's got to build through this town. 
and he he wants to he wants to run these people out of the town. Um, in the earlier quicksand debacle, friggin' Bart knocks this dude on a head. Uh, he gets sentenced to death, but then at the last minute, the tycoon's like, "Hey, I bet." This would be crazy and freak these guys out if I if if, if they showed up with a with a new black sheriff, and um, sends him out there, and you know we see that kind of happen out there. He meets uh, Gene Wilder, um, and it's it's I really I really like Gene's character in this, but Bart's awesome too, and uh, Corman's a dick, but he's funny, and um, but yeah, he meets Gene Wilder and. It, it it'll it'll it's it'll be at the beginning of the you'll you'll have heard it by now but my favorite line in the movie i think is when we first meet him and he's like hanging out hanging off this bunk in the in the jail cell and uh bart comes over he's like you need any help and he just goes oh all i can get <laughs> yeah. and it's just like uh that's life right there but um but yeah and then so, all right go on act two or whatever move on from there and so they send Mongo, the big guy, to kill the sheriff. And uh, Bart is very creative in ways to deal with problems. Uh, of course, one of the big ones is when he holds the gun to himself. That Okay, that, that is also one of my favorite parts, too. <laughs> Which is actually based on a situation that Mel Brooks was in as a kid. He had gone in to a local drugstore and he stole a squirt gun. And so they attempted to stop him, and he used the squirt gun, and he grabbed a patron inside of there and held him hostage and left. So that is actually a true story from an interview that I had watched a documentary on Netflix that's, I think, maybe only one or two years old, and Mel Brooks was talking about that. And that was so that that's kind of where that was born. So he, Mongo comes in takes care of him with a uh, candy gram that explodes in his face and we get the whole Warner Brothers music. The uh, Yeah, Bugs Bunny comes in basically and <laughs> handles everything very accordingly. So his, ap- his next, uh, Headley's next idea I was is... hoping you'd say Hedy so I could be like, Headley! Well, you know, they were sued from the actress Headley because of that's who they were referencing and there's a, uh, a line that Headley uses where he's like, well, we can sue her. And it's directly re- because of the situation that was happening in the film. So there's a lot of like little in, there's almost more. And that's why I think one of the reasons why it's sustained such a long period of time is that there is so little, so many inside little things. That and a lot people, of that stuff goes over my head. Yeah. You know, it's very much, a lot of it was obviously to the, to the time because of the, the writers. So Headley sends in Madeline Kahn's character, Lily von Stupp, and uh, she's a leggy German woman who he wants her to seduce Bart. And so she tries to seduce him and ends up falling in love with him instead, obsessively in love. And the only scene that he cut because the Warner Brothers executives were not fans of the film, besides the excessive use of the n-word and some of the other punching the horse was another scene they wanted out which was not really punched people it was actually horses that were trained to fall uh but they also there was and he did the only thing he cut there was a line that um uh bart says in the dark where originally he said that's my arm or no it's something to do with his arm like oh hey what are you doing that's my arm or something to that extent or is it like (laughs) Oh, your arm feels whatever, and you're like, "That's not my arm, baby." See, yeah, it was something to that extent. So that one he did take out. So uh, she falls in love with the, him. But that scene, though, when she turns around and goes, "Oh, where'd you go? <laughs> I can't see you." Yeah. Um. So, and after that, after that uh, backfires. Headley gets very upset, and then he decides that he needs to round up every single bandit. <laughs> And bad person across the West, and we get a scene of all of them in line. And the the best part of that scene is, you know, you're going through the line, and there's like, you know, every it's just a complete line of anachronisms, and yeah. and it's you know, you got the the SS Nazis, and then uh, the Mexican bikers, yeah. and and then at the very end, the uh, the KKK clans members all suited up in their hoods, and will have a nice day on the back of their 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 shrouds or whatever. And then, and then, 
Gene Wilder goes out and he he's like, "Hey boys, look what I've got!" And then <laughs> Bart comes out, "We're all the white women." <laughs> And uh, then they, so, they they Han Solo and and uh, Luke Skywalker and pretty yep, much take the stormtroopers uniforms and stand in line and we get a, a funny scene of uh, well I told you to wash your hands <laughs> so you know he's really really uh, dirty that's why he's so dark and uh, that doesn't work very well and so from that point we get into him going to his old uh, railroad buddies and saying hey I need your help they build a fake town. To the, scam them. The and then when they're on their way there, uh, they they have a great plan to slow them down, which is just you know another one of the funny just surreal moments of the thing. Like you know it's like oh hold on I, I think I know something that'll slow them down. <laughs> For some reason the first thing I thought was like oh the quicksand's gonna be involved somehow or whatever, but no he he builds a toll booth <laughs> with like. Nothing on either side of it, but everybody like stops down at the middle of the toll booth <laughs> with the arm down and, and is like, you're going to have to go back and get a shit ton of dimes. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely love that. Uh, love that scene. Uh, I remember when I first watched it as a kid because uh, my dad is uh, an avid. Mel Brooks is one of his favorite comedians and, and, and filmmakers. Um, and because of the type that my dad loves lowbro brow humor and my that's why family guy is my dad's favorite tv show uh, so he, i always thought as a kid and i hadn't seen it for a while i always thought it was like a train crossing and they just have the sound of the train but the train's never coming and they're like man why is it this train coming and they just wait there for but the toll booth works so i always thought that as a as a kid so they over a night they build this fake town that really is probably just the set from yeah the film. from the other side from the other side. It's all the flats. Which is kind of a, almost a foreshadowing of breaking the fourth wall. I felt maybe I'm reading more into yeah, it, I but guess breaking so. the fourth wall a little bit after. Because it just goes off the fucking rails once the, the big brawl finally happens. Well, they, they, lure, the, they lure the guys into the town. Uh, I guess they were going to rig the place with dynamite, but it wasn't happening right. So then, of course, that meant... Uh, uh, what, what's his nickname, Jim's nickname? The Dakota Kid or something like that? Waco Kid. Waco Kid. Uh, he has to, you know, and there's all that the whole that big hubbub at the beginning. Like, there's two t- two references to why he doesn't do this stuff anymore, uh, beyond the story he told about the kid. Um, it was like this was my shooting hand, yeah. and then uh, and then you know later on when he first shows up with uh, with when he shows up with Bart back at the when he's seeing his old uh, railroad buddies, and uh, the the guy's like, oh, he can't shoot anything, like. Because his hand, mm-hmm. uh, whatever. But then the rest of the movie, he shoots just fine. Yeah, he's fine. But yeah, so he shoots the dynamite, blows some stuff up. The brawl continues to happen and kind of escalates. And and really, this is with this being a sort of spoof and satire of, of westerns. Uh, there was always the big big brawl, uh, usually in a saloon or something. Tables getting flipped over. Um, and and but but our saloon ends up becoming the Warner Brothers commissary. And it just, yeah, it goes off the rails, kind of. And it, we we pull back, and we're in a studio all of a sudden, and and it's just the, the fight just carries across everywhere. And it was it was weird, but fun. Well, that's a Mel Brooks staple: film within a film, a play within a play. I mean, he has you know producers, he has the history of the world. I mean, that's a common trope for him. So uh, I think that's part of it. But from what I've gathered, the reason that he did it is at that point. Hollywood and, and people had felt that mm, those westerns were really not even remotely close. They were so Hollywood. You know, you had John Wayne playing, you know, all these ridiculous Indian characters and stuff like that, where it was just super whitewashed. So I think that was kind of maybe like the one, one of the in your face type of uh, points that he was trying to make. Um, besides, you know, hey, look at this, you know, racism and, you know, these type of stereotypes and stuff type of thing. So I think that's kind of why it went in there. And uh, it probably started with some coke fuel thing from Richard Pryor and then just went from there. Because the writing, you know, they got together. Two people, two of the guys that have writing credits were actually like realtors or something like that. So they weren't even there for the whole process. They Isn't there wrote... a line? Was I watching something else last night or was it in that where he, someone says like, you know, like, you don't trust a realtor or something like that. Yeah, that, I'm pretty sure that is exactly why that's in there. 
And uh, so they would write for like four or five hours uh, feverishly. And then after that, they would take a break from one another. <laughs> yeah. They'd take a break from one another and then they'd hit back to it. And uh, towards the end of the writing period, because they had a short period of time to write it, because it was just an outline originally. And then from there, they uh, had to write quite a bit. And those two guys left and it was just him and Pryor. Uh, but he said that had some houses Pryor- to sell. Really, most of what he did was Mongo stuff. That was pretty much his go-to thing is that, that he's credited for is coming up with the character, what the character did. <laughs> Mongo so, just a pawn. Yeah. So uh, most of the other stuff was, uh, was Brooks, which makes sense because you, it feels very much. Because, you know, he didn't want to do the film because it wasn't something he originally wrote himself. And they're like, he's like the ri- guy who wrote the outlines. Like, well, you can do whatever you want with it. And so uh, it was called like Black Bart is what it was called before Blazing Saddles. And if you see in the scene where Headley goes in to see the f- premiere of the film, the poster says Black Bart. No, oh, does it? The because the marquee says Blazing Saddles, mm-hmm. and that was that was fun. They're like, you know, let's let's go see the end of the movie. Yeah. And they go in there, and uh, Jim's got the the popcorn, and then they they start watching the the end of the movie. And uh, when G- when when Bart walks by Gene, he's still got the popcorn, yeah. like sitting outside in the in the in the old west. So that, and then of course they ride off into the sun to nowhere special. To nowhere special, they ride off to a Cadillac and then drive off into the sun. Which uh, uh, I read, and I don't know if it's true. It wasn't something that I heard um, <clears throat> Brooks say, but it is something that supposedly Cadillac was involved in it in some way and it was like they hey cat they're like we need a car or whatever and they're like hey we need some extra money maybe it was you know they, that's what it was, it was like Cadillac was because of the fact that they you know got some licensing which wasn't a very a huge thing in films you know like it was geez in the 80s you know let me see this coke and let me turn this a little bit right here Pepsi well how about the uh <clears throat> the <clears throat> the Jeep in um, Batman versus Superman. That's like some crazy special edition new Jeep SUV. I think even uh, Bruce Wayne's private jet. I just they had like a whole thing with uh, Affleck where there he was talking, and then he was. It was actually a commercial though for this like jet company, and I'm like, I've never seen a jet company commercial. Like that's not something you see. Like, well, there's gonna be a lot of people watching the Super Bowl. How many of them can afford a private jet? Four. They're already at the Super Bowl, not watching commercials. Yes, exactly. Uh, so that's kind of that's kind of interesting. Uh, so you know what's and I didn't get a chance to look this up. So the guy who played Taggart, right? The kind of hey, super heel yeah. guy. His name's Slim Pickens. Okay, that's his <laughs> real name. So is that a thing that they named him because it's a really old saying? Or is the saying because I wasn't around in the seventies because of this guy? Like, man, that's some slim pickings. I, like, it, maybe the actor did something else. It had to be a stage name. But that's such a weird name to pick. Well, I mean, it's fun. Like, you know, because check it out. Like, you gotta. What was the studio system like back then? Were there like unions and shit, or was it still this? The, the, the that system had broke down by this time. Well, yeah, but like, not like okay, not the studio system. So what is it? They have SAG. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you, when you apply to SAG, you got to pick a different name. Like, say someone already had his name, and he's like, "Oh, all these names are Slim Pickens." By George, my name is Slim Pickens now. I just think it's such a ridiculous name because you a you're a you're not slim, and b that's not a very <laughs> positive thing to give yourself. It's a it's it's a it's a ironic name. Maybe he was the original hipster. The original the original yeah. uh, hipster. He was the real Slim Pickens. Someone was like, "Hey, would you please stand up?" And I definitely saw if I were to cast a sequel, that would be Sanchez's character. He'd play him. He'd have to know how not have a beard though for that one. And but and he'd also play the drunken hillbilly that's in the one that's yelling when the, the prospector bell's going off. Yeah, the pro. No, no, the prospector I thought was a different guy. The one with the really long periscope when he's looking. Oh, it was it was it wasn't he, the that same was a person. skinny one. Yeah, and the other one was like a more fat kind of white haired bearded guy okay. that uh, the one that's yelling like he's ding near. What the, the the sheriff's near? Uh, I love that part too. Um, so yeah, I, I that's who I would cast. I no, would see, cast mine is um is is uh, Chappelle is Bart, and and like Jonah Hill is uh, what's his face, Jim? 
Jim, yeah. Waco kid. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, if it's not going to, and it's Mel Brooks, but if it's not that, it's going to be Paul Feig and uh, uh, Leslie Jones is Bart and Melissa McCarthy is, uh, will end up being. Oh man, I can't see a movie. I'm on a ban. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on a, a, a Melissa McCarthy ban. I just don't find her funny. No, I'm, I'm not. I'm, this, okay, we're talking about Blazing Saddles, not 45 minutes of bashing Melissa on Melissa McCarthy. Well, that will be our my next podcast, the <laughs> Melissa McCarthy bash. We're launching um, the Fourth Kind Entertainment Podcast Network. Yeah, it, it, we are. We're just going to literally have, here's a thought. We've talked about it more than once, so let's do it as a <laughs> podcast. Uh, <laughs> So this is also the third film from Mel Brooks. He had uh, another interesting part of why they weren't able, they couldn't make him change anything is because he had uh, Final Cut. Ah. So he was like, he wrote down all the notes that the Warner Brothers executives had. And then he proceeded when he got off of the elevator to crumble up the piece <laughs> of paper and throw it in the trash. So it was, it was his third film. And he'd done producers and then one other one that I can't remember the name of off the top of my head. So here's a, 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 another kind of interesting little tidbit. It was actually the first movie to show farts. Yeah, I, 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 had, I had seen that in, a, in something else. Yeah, it, it's the first movie to have... It's, like it's like Psycho with a toilet flushing. Yeah. It's things that you just feel like it's not a big deal. And one of my dad's favorite types of jokes, like if there's <laughs> farting in something, my dad loves, like he's a, a mess, take him back to being a schoolboy. Uh, sorry, I'm giving away all your uh, your entire life, Dad. I can't say it was one of my more liked parts of the movie. It was... yeah, it's, not, it's not a big deal, but yeah, it wasn't like, you know, I've seen better scenes that have flagellants. Flagellants? There was a TV pilot, too, in 1975. The, well, the next year? CBS. It actually aired. Just the pilot, yeah. Oh, shit. Louis Gossett Jr. Louis Gossett Jr.? He was uh, he was Bart Black Bart. Who who did Mel Brooks have anything to do with it? No, zero, absolutely nothing to do with so it. So was it funny? <laughs> I don't know. It's it is on YouTube, but I didn't have time to watch it. Dude, last night. you know what I finally found recently was the um the Clerks ABC live action pilot they did, and it was god awful. Jim Brewer's like uh Jim Brewer plays Randall. Mm -hmm. It was it was pretty shitty. You can see why it wasn't picked up. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't like let's start a petition. 15 years, 20 years later. <laughs> no, but I was really interested to see it. Not because then, you know, like four or five years later, they had the animated series and it was really good. I have to get in at least one Kevin Smith reference, I guess, every episode. Like, he's a podcaster and a yeah. talker and Smodcast. does things. He talks about stuff and films, stuff and things. So here's an interesting question Do you think The 12 Chairs was the film between the producers and Blazing Saddles? 12 Chairs. Do you think that this film could be made the way it was today? I mean, could it, yes, it could be made. Let's the. Uh, but I think pretty much you. Could, would a studio greenlight a rated R comedy? I don't know how well did Thousand Ways to Die in the West do? Horrible. Okay. Absolute failure. Uh, if it wasn't for Ted Two, McFarlane probably wouldn't be making another movie. <laughs> um. Like well, I I just feel like it would be it, it it could be made as an episode of Family Guy or something, or uh. So so by that effect, I think maybe some studio head or somebody would put up the money for it or. Well, and the if you factor, or maybe in not at a studio. Six was a failure too with Adam Sandler, and that was another raunchy. You know what you say that, and I've I've seen it in other places too, but I've also it's it's like it's highly rated star wise on the on the site. Um, I mean, there was all the, the drama you heard about when it was in production and stuff, but like, a, like I keep hearing people talk about that movie. Like my brother tried to get me to watch it. And then freaking when I was out, yeah, it was, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, general consensus is, uh, 5% on the tomato meter. So there's, it doesn't mean that there's not people that like it, but overall to green light, a, a studio version of blazing saddles. I think that the be bigger issue is that. At that time, we were, I think, as a society, much more willing to kind of laugh at ourselves. I think. I think that, it's still relevant. It's still relevant, definitely. I think that now, with the way that we're all connected and everybody has a voice, that maybe people felt the same way back then. Maybe not. I can't say for one way or another. But definitely, people weren't as able to voice their loud 
disagreement with it. I don't know. What about uh, like when Keaton was announced? Like there was no internet then, but there was still this like insane backlash when Keaton was announced as um, Batman. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's so. I mean, uh, there's still the there's still voices and there's still people that can hear them. Not to the degree. I just I think I feel like as a society that it's more difficult even when when that's one of the things that I when I first had talked to Ron and stuff and he says you can you know I was like hey is it you know what's the comedy world shifting to because there's some people that have continued because they were there beforehand so you expect that this is the way it is and he says well he's seen a major shift in just the way that crowds react to certain jokes because of this um I don't know, trolling or whatever people want to call it. I'm not, like I said, I don't know if it's necessary that there's more people. PC policing. Yeah, PC policing and and groups, new groups against everything. You know, I'm, a, or I'm for against everything. headphones. Or for. I'm starting this for. So, and I think it's fine to have well, I don't know, you, you're like against stuff. my headphones? Yesterday in that meeting with 76, you were talking about color correction. He's like, oh, Alex, I don't like the color of his face. So I can just be like, I was like, racist. Yeah. yeah. If, if, well, if we came out with a film and somebody said that we whitewashed, I would literally just change your color to Indian or Hispanic or, or black, and then we're fine. That would probably be worse. But then we get into the other side of that, though, is like you said, there are people that still do it. And It's Always Sunny is a perfect example. They do not care. And they have done some of the things that some people won't even touch, like blackface. They have done multiple times. So, and I'm not saying that they're probably it's old hat groups. for the gang. Yeah, and then I'm not saying there's probably. I don't really. I don't. I just don't. I don't see it like as a top headline as I do other things because, like I like I think that it's just people of like eh, we they're not going to change it. So what's the use of uh, of doing it? So I think that there is a possibility. I think it would be more difficult to get made at this time. Uh, so what would you give the rating for for this film? For this film, um, we're gonna have to go with. You go first. We're gonna have to go with me going first. Okay, so I am going to say that it is still one of my favorite comedies, uh, not my favorite comedy of all time, but it is definitely still up there. So I give it four out of five horse punches. Horse punches that are trained to fall, people. It's not a real horse. <laughs> Peta, don't call me. I won't call you. I don't know. I can't think. I can't. Oh, okay. Um, I'm gonna do uh, uh, four out of five uh, paddle balls. Paddle balls. Well, he was handing those out in lieu of pay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I always get a warped one. So let's talk about uh, the sequels. Let's t- let's start to talk about a little bit of sequel ish, since we were. That's a good segue, even though we jumped the ratings in between. Yeah, I I already already gave mine. Well, you're not like the, what the story was per se. No, I didn't. You just said who you'd cast. I don't have a story. You have no story. No, <laughs> nothing. That's just you'd cast those people. They'd be the same characters. Yeah, yeah. Um, or, except in in with the the Mel Brooks version, it's uh, it's it's. David Chappelle and first person I thought it was Jonah Hill, but it could be somebody else. But yeah, that one would actually be a sequel. That wouldn't be a remake. A sequel? Yeah. What would they? What's the What's the Waco kid and Bart up to? I don't know. I I couldn't I couldn't get that far. I just because I I just had all this Ghostbuster stuff on my mind. So first I thought of the female version that Paul Feig's gonna do, and then uh, but uh, but but yeah. That's that's all I got on that. No one. story, but we got a cast, and we got a, a a very elderly director, and in with with Seth MacFarlane waiting in the wings to to take over, like just hunching over Mel Brooks in case he passes out or dies. Mm-hmm. Okay, he's just he's just he's just right there waiting, just like a vulture, yeah. <laughs> just was just circling around. No, uh, actually, what it is is uh, Spaceballs Two: The Search for Blazing Saddles. See, that's kind of what I was thinking for my idea is that it would be a crossover between Spaceballs and that they like literally Blazing Saddles is just a planet that they land on in Spaceballs. And uh, you'd have to recast uh, pretty much everybody. Maybe you can get Mick, Mick, Rick Moranis. God, 
I want to say Dick. Uh, well, I guess Richard Dick, right? Well, you, you, he is, you know, supposedly willing to come back and start doing because his kids are older now. Yeah. Uh, to pick because they he did they That's did talk story. to him. Hey, he was a smart man. He didn't want to be in the Ghostbusters. Everybody else did. I mean, even Bill Murray has a cameo, doesn't he? Yes. And then I mean, Bill Murray also did Garfield twice. Frig- <laughs> And Dan Aykroyd can he has done nothing. So this this is you know what's awesome about the Bill Murray Garfield thing. So so okay, Bill Murray plays Garfield in the movie. The guy who did Garfield's voice originally did did Vankerman's voice. Yeah, yeah. that guy was always the go to guy in the eighties and early nineties for uh, people that wanted to sound like Bill Murray <laughs> or characters that sounded like Bill Murray. Yeah, no, I like that guy. There was a few other shows too that I can't remember off the top of my head that I'm like, you know, that you could just Did, tell. Wasn't he like Mr. Belvedere or something like that? Something. Some something old sitcom. something to that extent. Um so that would be my my portion of it. I would say that I would go with Mel Brooks too. He's a very spry 89-year-old man. Yeah, like maybe he'll have like a quick little quick little renaissance and do uh he'll like back to back he'll do uh new new blazing saddles and new new space balls. Like in real life. In real life. Yeah, yeah, yeah like I mean, after he does cuz he's talking about doing new space balls and then if he does that, recasts go well. Maybe recast some more and do further stuff with blazing saddles. I don't know. Well, you know, about five or six years ago, he had talked about doing a because you know he had he's done everything else as a musical, even Young Frankenstein. Uh, that he had been talking about doing Blazing Saddles, and he said, "Oh, the music's written, and it's like 2010 and stuff, but nothing's uh, really come of that." Yeah, I think I was thinking about that last night. I was like, "This has to have been made as a musical." I mean, if if Spamalot and Evil Dead are musicals, yeah, this this wouldn't be very. It has song and dance numbers in it already in there, so and it's not like. There was our town is turned to yeah. shit. <laughs> it's not like it'd be very difficult just to have you know sets for that. It's not like it's very you know effects heavy or anything to that extent. No, what'll happen is it'll just be like a shitty flash animated cartoon like that uh, Spaceballs one was. No, oh, yeah, yeah, that wasn't the that wasn't the best. I wanted all. to like that. I was kind of excited about it, but so did, here's a little uh, one other little known fact. I'm spreading these out during the entire podcast. So. Did you know Gene Wilder was not the original Jim? Who was it? They actually filmed the original Jim, and his name was Gig Young. The original Jim. The original Waco kid. And so the scene, the first scene that they shot with him was where he was hanging upside down, and he was, you know, drunk, hungover. And so action. Mel Brooks is filming the scene, and he gives his line. He says, you know, you know, you're black. <laughs> and uh, he just, he's like, wow, Mel Brooks, like, this guy's really playing this drunk 100% well. The guy turns blue and starts coughing up green stuff, and they have to call an ambulance and, rus- and, and take him to the hospital. And the reason why is because he was a real drunk. And so from that point forward, Mel Brooks said, I am never hiring another, re- another real alcoholic. <laughs> So uh, they quickly had brought in Gene Wilder. And during the filming, Gene Wilder had actually presented Young Frankenstein as an outline to Mel Brooks. That's why it had come out so quickly within the same year, is that they were writing the script for Young Frankenstein while filming Blazing Saddles. Because in the, the honest to God truth is Gene Wilder's on the set every day, but Gene Wilder's not in the film very much. He's really a really small supporting role. So that's very interesting, I think. That's pretty cool. To find out. Anytime what? I see Gene Wilder in something, I I just always <laughs> enjoy him. Um, and I thought he was dead. I, and- yeah, I was t- same thing with Wendy last night. I was like, both of those guys are dead now. And Wendy was like, Gene Wilder's not dead. And she had to do pulled up IMDb and made me look like an asshole. Which I had just done to Danny when we had our, our friend Danny would have gone out to lunch. And he was talking about and one of the Avengers cartoons that it was um, not Scott Lang as Ant-Man, that they had done um, Pym. <clears throat> I said no. And so I found it, and I proved him wrong, and then it was never spoken of again, <laughs> as that usually goes. Yes, Gene Wilder's just been retired, and so and you haven't read it yet, so I'm not going to give it away, but the kind of mastermind behind the huge Easter egg hunt in Ready Player One, since it has a Willy Wonkish type of feel to the book, that... 
supposedly that he had been approached by Spielberg to come out of retirement to play the main character. The, not, not main character, but the main guy who does that, the older gentleman who passes, who has a lot of Avatar stuff being shown. Hmm. And I've seen a picture of Gene Wilder, and he just looks like an older version of himself. Yeah. He's still got really long hair. It's a little curly. Piercing eyes. Kind of, yeah. So that would be interesting to see him back. There's a, you know, go one more, one more time. Yeah. So my- Because uh, See No Evil, Hear No Evil is the last film I think he was in. With you Richard Pryor. Yeah, which is a long time ago. Thought maybe that's another thing that got in, got into my head was that movie. You had maybe kind of got a mixed up. Yeah. But um, so one of the things I've been enjoying about doing the podcast, and I've addressed it before, is you know seeing a movie and then and then realizing where something has come from that I've seen in other things. And the biggest one for me on this one, I mean, aside from kind of seeing the DNA of uh, of uh, Family Guy and in, in spoof stuff, spoof yeah. stuff and uh, comedy like that. I mean, I'd seen other. I've seen the only Mel Brooks I've seen going in is um, Young Frankenstein. And Men in Tights, maybe something else. Uh, I think I tried to watch some of Dracula Dead and Loving It when I was little, but I, I lost interest. I didn't. Was, yeah, that's a, that one of the best. But um, but the, the other History of the world, huh? History of the world. No, I've seen I've seen like one or two vignettes, but that's about it. I don't think I've ever seen the whole thing. That was speaking of an uproar. He had a big uproar since he plays Hitler in there, and they're like, "How can a Jewish man play Hitler?" And I feel I think he said something to the extent he says 10 million Jews has allowed me to be able to pay Hitler. something to that extent, because uh, Mel Brooks really says what's on his mind. But uh, but the big the big one for me was um, the show Frisky Dingo um, uh, it's the show that uh, the creators of Archer made before that. And then before Frisky Dingo, they made C-Lab. But there's there's these two characters. There's, you know, the the Xander Cruz character. And he's like a billionaire philanthropist kind of thing, you know, and but he he's retarded or stupid can i say that i'm sorry that, that wasn't cool he uh but he um and he's also a superhero but he's got this sort of like weird assistant kind of always whispering in his ear stan and it, it when i saw when i saw headley and the governor uh it very much is stan and xander yeah. cruz and um i i just i just i just loved it and and then uh there was this other part um, and it's going back to Family Guy, but the 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 Blue Harvest, the Star Wars episode, mm -hmm. when when Chris Luke is out there, and then he then he goes like, "Ladies and gentlemen, John Williams," and then the, you know they pan over, and it's it's there, it's the whole band out in the desert, and it was a lot like that scene when Bart's like walking up after he becomes sheriff, going to the town, and then yeah, there's the whole playing, the big band it, right there. April the something is the name of the song. I can't remember exactly, but uh, yeah, no, I definitely. I'm almost positive that's what it was for because you're doing a uh, spoof on Star Wars, which is space ball. So it's not really far then to bring in some blazing saddles, right? It's a lot, not a lot of uh, degrees of separation. So that was, that was fun. So that, I, I'm pretty sure that was pretty much my biggest, uh, my biggest. Also the part where um, Madeline Kahn's character is uh, dancing around and kind of trying to be a distraction, right? That pretty much is uh, False Maria in Metropolis. Mm -hmm. So that, that I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. That's what that that's that's his thoughts on on the film. <laughs> so let's talk about uh, we've already did our kind of sequels. We didn't really go the same route as we usually did. Uh, yeah, well, I didn't have a story. I, mine was just an idea too, and I didn't really have a cast. I had a director. Um, we did talk about recasting because there's unfortunately no John Candy to be in the Spaceballs portion. Yeah. Um, maybe maybe it's um... Wilder out of retirement can still be Billy the uh, Billy the Kid, uh, Waco the Kid, still the kid, Waco still kid. A guy, yeah. Um, so let's talk about sequels to other films. Oh God. And I had gone first last time, so it is now your turn. To go first. Okay. And your sequel is going to be What If? Okay, there's a little setup to this. Okay. What if the new Ghostbusters wasn't being made? What would be your pitch for a new Ghostbusters? Uh I don't know if this how much of this is what I heard some of the rejected scripts were about or 
just trying to get the timer going. Sorry. That's all right. I got it on here. Oh. I can see it because it's counting oh, up on okay. the phone. Never mind. Sorry. Um, all right. Go. Yep. Go. All right. Ghostbusters 3. It is. Uh, three or 3? Three? Three. All right. Ghostbusters 3. three. It's like we're, we're going to get Ween. We're going to get the band Ween in to do the nice. soundtrack. They're going to remake uh, 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 What's His Face's song. Um, I want to. <laughs> Ghostbusters? Isn't that what it's called? <laughs> yeah. Ray Charles Jr., but I was trying to remember who made oh. the other one. <laughs> I remember that Bobby Brown had a song at the end of the second one. Yeah, I like that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it doesn't run DMC that has the one that's in the montage in the second one. Maybe. It's been a, the second one's the one I've seen the least. You so. call the Ghostbusters. Yes, yeah. that's who you call. I, 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 I ain't afraid of no ghosts. Okay, no, sorry. So I'm half the movie will be reminiscing time. about the previous movies, it's which this, makes sense. We're going to get Chris Farley. We're going to dig him up, and he's just going to be like, so it, it'll be Dan Aykroyd and uh, everybody. And uh, we're gonna dig up Ramus too, and um, and and it, 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 yeah, he'll just he'll just we'll just be like, you remember that? That was awesome. This that's what's gonna happen. I lost my train of thought. What was I talking about? Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters three. three. Ghostbusters three. No, um, well, we're gonna go to the afterlife in uh -huh. this one. Uh, original cast. Um, we get uh, we get our best Harold Ramis impersonator, and uh, we have a digital CGI uh, ghost. Ramus, Ghost Ramus, Ghost Ramus, mm -hmm. um, Egon, Ghost Egon. Uh, Egon gets killed, and they have to go back to the afterlife to get him. But something's gonna happen, keeping them from doing that. Uh, uh, so yeah, that's 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 pretty much it. I want to have Luke Besson direct it, mm -hmm. and yeah, Ramus not gonna direct this one, even though he's 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 in it. No, I was kidding about actually digging people up. We're not going to dig him up. It's no, no. he's his character's in it. We're going to get a Harold Ramis impersonator to do the voice. Or I think they could probably do a hologram type of thing. I mean, they do it with Tupac and other dead people. I was, I was thinking about something like that, but I, it, you, you you haven't seen that technology in such great use just yet. So I don't know if they're there. So I feel like we could we could just animate them and then get get we'll get the guy from the fucking cartoon. That's the guy we'll from the cartoon. Yeah. Yeah, well, he can do it. He they brought him back for Ghostbusters Extreme, the nineties. Yeah. And uh, did you see the? There was a somebody re-edited the trailer to the theme song from the nineties version of the cartoon. Yeah, it was kind of interesting. No, I didn't see that, but I did. I mean, I saw the the tag, but I've uh, Facebook blocked all Ghostbusters stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, my turn. I have a sequel. You have a sequel? <clears throat> no, I mean that I do. I'm going to have a sequel. Here soon. So I need you to uh, make the sequel to. See, I thought about my sequel to Blazing Saddles, but I didn't think about what I was going to ask you. And this is this is me every time. I apologize. Um, you're going to make the. You're going to make Short Circuit Three. Short Circuit Three. Well, it's been so long since in the first two. I can't even remember what uh. they're about. <clears throat> I know you cried a little bit inside hearing that. Not that I, I mean, it was a film that I watched quite a bit as a kid, but I was so little. And it was not something that I revisited as I've revisited other films. So um, Johnny Five is now a robot that's being made by the Russians. Okay. So the Russians. Like mass produced? Well, he's a prototype for something that they're going to mass produce. And. He is like they steal him. Hmm? They steal him, and they're going to copy him. Yeah. They're what the gonna... hell was that? Are we about to lose video? We did lose video because of time. Sorry, guys. That's all right. We got most of it. We'll just have some pictures in this last two minutes. So my sequel is that they have Johnny Five, and he is stolen and brought back to life because I'm assuming that he was dead and if, if he wasn't then he, somehow he died in between the films or was turned off the, the, no dude he's he's totally an independent citizen by the end of the second one he's all like gold plated well and he shit. died in between Ugh. and so he had been long That's forgotten so by society and the Russians find him in a in a very large dumpster and Ben wouldn't put him in a dumpster somebody did he Ugh. lost he lost his way and it wasn't his fault it was society's fault, okay? There's a whole part of Is that Is it like society. the beginning of Gremlins when the old man dies and, like, Mogwai has to go somewhere? Oh, no, that's the beginning of Gremlins too, is isn't it? Yeah. 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 And so they're building him as a weapon, and he's, on, he's happy to be alive again. And he 
is hopeful because they're asked that he's he's trying to help them build all this stuff until he realizes that he's being used as a weapon or being trained as a weapon. And they, all those fil- mo- uh, little clips that we've been seeing of harassing robots yeah, that dude. would go in there, they'd be harassing him and he's going to have to fun. It's not, it's going to be a fun movie. It's not going to be <laughs> violent. I mean, you do have the bad guys, the the Russians and stuff e- like that. Each of the first one had a heart wrenching scene where Johnny five got fucked up. That's and that's would be the scene where he's being harassed yeah. and stuff. So him and these other prototypes that he's being helped and build, they all work together to kind of set up Home Alone style traps. Does he figure is because he kind of does that in the first one, but the, he's just kind of programming and controlling them. Does he figure out how to instill sentience is, in the now, new in these new guys? That you, is what ends up happening at the end of the film, and then they very much are in a planet of the robots scenario. <laughs> And, it's uh, the singularity because yeah. he's like building versions of himself. Yeah, and, and so that would be the film. It would be very much in the vein of an '80s film. It would have the villains and clear-cut bad guys, and there would be that heart-wrenching scene. But we would also have uh, a lot of playfulness and people getting hurt. Cartoonish. Who's uh, who's the who's the main villain? And henchman. The, the main villain would be oh. That's a good question. I I have a thought. What's your thought? Dolph. Dolph Lundgren? I think he'd be the definitely the henchman guy. But the overarching henchman, like you don't think he's made it up to to main villain yet? He's still muscular. Like I think that yeah, he's a muscular guy. But he's also really he's, he he it could play into his his smarts and stuff cuz like in real life he's got like this crazy degree and is a scientist. I thought that was just a joke. No, that's that's a, real. That's a thing. It was a commercial I saw and I thought that No, was... cuz that's yeah, that's that's like one of the first times I've ever seen him address that, but that's like a real thing. Unless I'm a dumbass, somebody. Will. I would have. If we had any listeners, they would tell, come and tell me. I would have. I God, I can't remember his name. Commissioner Gordon from Batman Begins and all that. Oh, uh, Oldman. Yeah, Oldman would play the uh, actual brains of the operation. Not saying sorry, so he's Dolph. Gonna, he's going to be the bad version of his character in the RoboCop remake. Yes. Oh, that's horrible. He'd be Russian though, with a Russian accent. Okay, I'm into that. Yeah, like yeah. oh, he'll be uh, he'll be uh, actually I don't remember where he was from, but the guy his the villain from uh, Air Force One. Yes, okay. and Scarlett Johansson would be the sympathetic wo- uh, scientist or robot scientist that uh, Johnny Five they get a bond together. So check, they have a bond. So what's going to happen is there's a part where because Johnny Five never says it during this. And like, there's a part where they're fucking up Johnny Five, and they're like gonna take him apart or something. And she she's like banging on the window, like because she got broken English because she's a she's Russian. No disassemble Johnny Five. <laughs> I think that would be awesome. Yeah, and they do, and she helps them together. They overthrow old men and L- Lundgren and tons of. For some reason, this facility has a lot of armed people. But oh, you're working in in with. Bombs and weapons and stuff that makes sense. And then, uh, and then, it, and then it turns out that that Scarlett Johansson's cousin in America is Ali Sheedy. Yep, it could be. I mean, that's a lot of backstory for our character. I'm not quite seeing this much backstory, but my I mean, my version has my version has more fan service, more fan service, <laughs> and so it it's just going to be called Short Circuit Three. There's no subtitle. There wasn't in the second one, but I kind of thought like, what if they go with the what if they go with the trend of dropping the the top, the number and just going like short circuit singularity? Yes, okay, that could happen. That could happen. As and as a a, a director, I don't have one. But I, I, in my defense, I had a lot more story and other things than you did. Yeah. yours. so <laughs> I can leave out one portion of it. So. Fourth kind of entertainment, Unseen Classes, episode six. You guys get this on and subscribe to us on iTunes. You can go to our website, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all of the social media platforms. We still at some point where we get a little bit further into this as we create the podcast network. Um which well, hey, you never the know. Empire. Some of these one-off ones might start as one-offs, and yeah, we're gonna do like we said next week. We're doing uh, unsqueezed lemons. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna watch the room. It's gonna be awesome. It's also, I think, pretty much the first time uh, that it straight up is you have not seen it, and I have. We both mm-hmm. hadn't seen Metropolis, right? No, I'd seen Metropolis. Well, there was one that we watched that you hadn't seen. I forget what it was. 
I don't know. Okay, maybe I'm full of shit. I couldn't remember is more what it was. Uh, okay. it, but I couldn't remember. Okay, well, no, that. it was a Metropolis. I hadn't seen it. I only, saw, but I, when I watched, it, I realized I had seen it. Oh, okay, but um, we're also gonna do our our frequent collaborator Rolfi. Uh, recently discovered Nine Inch Nails, so and I, I was very excited, and he li- just listened to his, his my my personal favorite album, The Fragile. And uh, he had never heard it. To me, The Fragile is a classic. So we're going to do an episode of Unheard Classics with a with a special guest, Rolfie. And I think that'll be fun. You talk to him about it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Rolfie, if you're listening to this, you are unfortunately have been, or not for, unfortunately, fortunately, you have been uh, selected to yeah. be a guest star. You've been drafted. No, so I'd like to go ahead and like just, we'll just put that up whenever uh, along with a, a nor- our normal schedule of this or something. And I want to start doing filmmaking blogs that we have already as podcasts we're trying to figure out the how that's going to work and stuff but those ones will be a little bit this is just us you know just kind of chit-chatting talking about films we hadn't seen the, the other one will be a little bit more informative for people who are aspiring filmmakers since we have gone through the process now for a few years to you know some successes some failures what's worked what hasn't so i just would like to you know share that knowledge because it's I want people to I want people to succeed. I want there to be, you know, somebody who creates the next classic that we you might unsee for years. Yeah, yeah, we want to help we want to help someone make make a movie that yeah, I, I'll go for 20 years not seeing. That he'll just put his nose up when he hears about it. And... Well, I've never done that to, to a lot of these movies. Well, I just I just never I'm assuming Jaws may have been a nose up for a while there, yeah, because yeah, I went through a weird Spielberg thing. All right, so until next time, I'm Jason. I am Alex.